All right, let's go ahead and get started. It's noon, and so as we get going today, um, I'll pray for us, and then we're going to jump into chapter 14. You've already seen this uh, presentation, at least a little bit, the PowerPoint, um, and then we can answer some questions. It ties in directly with what Dr. Morris talked about in terms of diabetes the other day. So let me pray for us, and we'll get started. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity to meet with our students and to interact with them, and I do pray that you would just help us to... um, to handle these cases well, these conditions. And we may not see them all the time, but they are are opportunities for us to provide excellent care across a wide spectrum uh, of patient settings and populations. So I just pray that you would help our students to manage those situations well. Lord, um, I pray that you would be with our students as they finish out the term. I know there is a lot to accomplish in just a few weeks, so give them the rest they need. Help them just to continue to prepare well and to do things in a way that brings honor to you. So, Lord, I thank you for them. I thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to meet with them again today. And again, the opportunity to hopefully um, uh, grow them professionally and allow them to serve patients well. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so, some of you know I was under the weather yesterday, and I got to see what it was like to be on the other side of that um, situation. And so I had to have a rapid COVID test, which was negative. And so I had to do that, but I'm okay. But I'm a little sniffly today, so that'll be good. If you read the chapter in chapter 14, you see that these systemic conditions and these disorders, they may not be situations you see, especially in the sports medicine world all the time. But let me start off by sharing with you just one example of maybe an opportunity. So one of my former students called me a few years ago and said, Mike, I dealt with a patient that I just I didn't know what was wrong. She was at a large Division I school working baseball, and she was um, evaluating a shoulder injury, or what she thought was a shoulder injury. And she said, all the special tests came back negative. There was no, no rotator cuff, no labrum, no um, impingement syndrome, nothing like that. And she said, I just kept trying to figure out what's wrong with this student athlete. And every time she would palpate into the axilla, she would feel a little bit of swelling. And she said, I just thought lymph nodes, maybe he's got some infection. So she sent that baseball athlete to their team physician. The team physician said, well, this seems like it's something more. And so they referred that that athlete out for an MRI and a CT and found a grapefruit-sized tumor in his shoulder. Essentially, she saved that 19-year-old athlete's life because had that metastasized and grown into his shoulder, it probably would have spread. And so they removed it. They did chemotherapy. He sat out that year, started to pitch the following year. So again, even though some of these situations that we encounter, certainly diabetes is one you're going to see more commonly, but you may not see a a, a cancer diagnosis every year or every other year, but there's a chance, and so you need to be prepared for that. And that's what we're talking about mostly today, are these things that maybe they are more unicorns. Maybe they are um, some things that you're not as familiar with and won't see as often. So your textbook starts out dealing with the lymphatic system, which you already know. The lymphatic system is, is a, a filtration system. You can see that it's, it's, um, it actually moves fluids through the body. It draws them out. It eliminates some of these waste products. So as you can see it transports fat, protein, lymphatic fluid. That comes from your text. And you can see the organs are the, the spleen, the thymus, and the tonsils. Those are the most common. And then we have these lymph nodes. We're going to talk about those lymph nodes a lot here. But lymph nodes are found in the axilla, in the groin. Your textbook says cervical area, which is true, but it's right at the base of the scalp. And we're going to talk about this this concept uh, of inflammation and swelling with these shoddy nodes. That's what they're called, shoddy nodes. They'll be swollen. They'll be hard or rigid. And as you palpate them in the back of the, the skull, or as you palpate them in the axilla, you'll notice that they're, they, they push back a little bit. That's what you're looking for. And the fluid that you find is both lymph and interstitial fluid. Lymph is more clear in its presentation. Interstitial fluid, if we looked at it, might be a little more cloudy. <clears throat> and this is the lymphatic system. You've heard that term adenoids, or adenoid, maybe you didn't know where it was, in the back 
uh, of the throat in the, the, the soft palate there. And then obviously the tonsils. These are collection points. They grab onto this fluid. They move that waste product out. They eliminate those. And so it's helpful to not only know the anatomy, but to understand what the spleen does, what it's helping us do here. All right, so this is where we jump right into content. So overall, if we're going to talk about cancer, we're going to talk about either malignancy or benign. Okay. Malignant cells, they're the ones that grab on to normal tissue, and they start to replicate, and they look on imaging, as you can see in the upper right corner, they look fairly similar to a normal cell, but they have just this little deviation, this little change. Whether it's in blood, whether it's at an organ, they're going to look very similar to the normal cell presentation of that structure. But we have these tiny mutations. <clears throat> and what happens is that cell right here, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It mutates and doesn't have the same action. So under a microscope, we're going to see a cluster of regular cells and then one or two of these little anomalies. They are abnormal in appearance, function, but also, and this is the key, growth. In most cases, they grow rapidly. They take over in some structures. And so when we talk about malignancies, we're talking about these, these cells in overabundance that would normally have been normal functioning cells, they've been taken over. Talk about benign, that may be a lipoma, that may be a fatty tumor. It's, it's not cancerous, but it may have a similar presentation, again, on palpation or physical exam. We may take an image of it, whether it's through a CT or an MRI, but it's still not a cancerous either tumor or growth. And this is what we're talking about here. <clears throat> Benign and malignant. We've, we've kind of identified these. You can see how they look, these cells on the screen. <clears throat> so benign structure or benign growth. You may find this on a patient's you know, um, a thoracic wall. You may find it posteriorly on the back. And they will be palpable. You'll see them enlarge. You may find these on the face. But they typically are not cancerous and non-fatal. The malignancies are the ones that have that atypical growth. They spread. They metastasize. And they become our issue. And in, in physical exam, in evaluation, anything that looks weird, feels weird, and you're going to see my acronym here in just a second, any of those structures, it should raise a red flag for you as a clinician. You should say, huh, that seems out of the ordinary. That presentation doesn't seem, quote unquote, normal. If that's the case, trust your gut. Because we run into these carcinomas, these sarcomas. You see the carcinomas? Those are the epithelial cells that, that line uh, the, the internal organs and are also part of the, the skin. Those are the types of cancers we see most commonly. <clears throat> and the sarcomas, they deal with those structures in and around blood, lymphatic, the lymphatic tissue, lymphatic organs. And we're going to break those out in just a second. I love this acronym, and I've used it for years, because I think it helps you, as a clinician, kind of have this mnemonic device to say, this is what I should be looking for. So it's cautions. You can obviously read those. But these could be questions you would ask your patient, things you're looking for in terms of 
actual signs. So it may be a change in bowel or bladder habit. And this obviously is uncomfortable to ask a patient, but typically they'll bring this forward in exam. You're, they're in your, your room, in your office, and they'll say, I have noticed that I have been really sick for three weeks, four weeks, multiple months. Something's not right. <clears throat> Sores that won't heal. Unusual bleeding, especially when we're talking about patients who have um, colorectal cancers. They'll notice bleeding. Thickening, lumps. I know that Dr. Roberto talked about testicular cancer. It is typically found on self-exam not even clinician examination. But patients will palpate and notice they've got a change in the tissue, either thickness, the structure. The eye, the indigestion, or difficulty swallowing. I've shared this with you before. Anytime someone is having difficulty swallowing, they're aspirating, you should ask some questions. How long has that been going on? Is it only with liquids? Is it liquids? Is it, is it solid food? Now that could be GERD, but it might be a tumor. And we don't want to jump to that conclusion every time, but that is something you would look at. Obvious change in warts or moles, and we're going to talk about mottling in a little bit. But anytime they're asymmetric, they've got multiple colors in them, that's called mottling. The nagging cough, the hoarseness throat cancers, things like that. And then sleeplessness or change in sleep habits. Now you're going to see on a few slides that some of the patients we have that have active tumor growth, they have night sweats. I don't know if I shared this with you before, but night sweats are not just, hey, my room is a little warm and I'm sweaty. I'm a little uncomfortable. So you turn your ceiling fan on. You guys have ceiling fans in the dorms? I'm sure you don't. If you have a box fan or something. Night sweats are your patient wakes up every night saturated, soaked in, in their own sweat. And that's because those tumors are active when they're at rest. Um, we see this in, in all different types of, of cancer diagnoses that they have night sweats. Yes, they lose weight and all those things, but they'll, one of their chief complaints will be, I wake up every morning and I'm just soaked. That's a red flag, just so you know, that is a red flag. I hate that your textbook uses NHL as the abbreviation because now all you're thinking is, it's not the National Hockey League, it is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay? That's what you're thinking here. These are malignancies in these lymph and lymphoreticular systems. Again, you're going to see this, but I, I've, I've given you a highlight. I should have made this this part of the, the presentation, I should have highlighted it in red. We diagnose non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because there is no presence of Reed-Sternberg cells, which you'll see in just a second. That's how you know it's non-Hodgkin's. That's the clinical diagnosis or diagnostic tool at the cellular level, which you'll see on the next slide. You can see that the median age is about 50 years old. Does that make a difference? Yes, because a person who's significantly younger probably is not presenting with this. Doesn't mean they can't. And a patient who's significantly older, we hopefully would have found it. You can see that the most common sites at the abdomen, the mediastinum, the neck, so the central core of the body. And their signs and symptoms are there. Vomiting, diarrhea, weight loss, night sweats, fever, chest pain. Now these are things that everybody experiences at some point, right? We all know that. You're allowed to nod, it's okay. We know that. But if these symptoms are persisting, not just persistent, but persisting, if they're ongoing, and we've had weeks of this, months of this, there should be something that we catch on to when they're giving us their history, that we say, this doesn't seem right. Now, someone may say, oh, I've really had a lot of diarrhea lately. 
Sometimes you throw that out because they've traveled, they've had other things. But ask why. Have they traveled? Have they changed their diet? Okay. Weight loss is important. You're going to see this with all types of, of, of cancers. They're going to lose weight. It's not expected. It's unintended. And so they're going to lose weight. So track their records. They were 200 pounds two years ago. Now they're 165. Why is that? Ask those questions. Again, we're going to use our, our CT, our blood work. You can see the cells, what they look like. This washes out a little bit for you, but it's helpful. Here's your Hodgkin's lymphoma. These are those Reed Sternberg cells. They're large, multinucleated. That's what the Reed Sternberg cells are. You can see this. It almost looks like a set of eyeballs looking at you on this slide. <clears throat> a little different here. The histology is what tips us off. So we take a biopsy of the, of the site, whether it's a slice or a little punch biopsy, whatever it is. We put it under a microscope. We stain it, and that's what we see. We see these multinucleated cells, and they're scattered throughout the slide. <clears throat> you can see we may, we may have children, late teens, but the peak is between 25 and 30 years old. Again, most 25 to 30 year olds, cancer is not even on their radar. Maybe they've had a family member who's been sick or had a diagnosis. It's distant for them. But again, they come in weight loss. Night sweats. We ask those questions. What's going on? Let's do some blood work. Again, I shared this may not be something you see in a sports medicine arena, but some of you are going to be working in a physician office. Some of you are going to be in a small practice. <clears throat> you can see these signs and symptoms for Hodgkin's lymphoma. You'll palpate the lymph node. It feels larger. So palpating the axilla. Get behind the, the scalp. <clears throat> may not be painful, but you may feel some shift in that. Again, that could be the tumor itself. Night sweats. Again, you're hearing that a lot, I know. And then weight loss greater than 10% of their total body weight is one of the diagnostic characteristics of this. Now, your text doesn't say whether that's in one year or overall, typically you ask the question, was this intended weight loss? And they'll say no. You use a CBC, a CAT scan, and then if they have a cough, we do a chest film, a chest x-ray, to rule out things like pneumonia, things we might have in this diagnostic pool. And you see their, their treatment is chemotherapy. We're not talking about return to play a lot today because almost all of these situations you will return them to play, but they have to be asymptomatic. And they have to maintain normal body weight, things like that. Can they exercise? That, that, that'll be something you deal with individually. Leukemia, again, cancers of the blood. <clears throat> and we're commonly thinking of white blood cells that is affected. I love this term that most clinicians use, uncontrolled proliferation. Their white cell count is going to be ginormous. That's a, that's a technical term, you know that. It is going to be huge. It will be outside normal limits. And so in that case, that's probably the first thing that comes to mind. Their white cell count is, is elevated, and you're going to ask how many is too high. Well, in the, in the hundreds of thousands, too high. That comes to mind, and you say, this doesn't seem right, because they've got this other cluster of symptoms. They don't feel well. They are losing weight. They're doing those things. <clears throat> and you see statistically. It is among the top eight cancers in our adult population, but we see it more in children. 
So how do you deal with that pediatric athlete or patient who comes in? So your, your scenario, your situation is they're 12, 13, 14 years old. Mom and dad have noticed they're fatigued. Mom and dad have noticed that they uh, are sleeping more. They're not as active. Maybe their nutrition seems to have gone down because they're just not hungry. As a clinician, it's, it's easy to jump to the, the conclusion of saying, well, this is leukemia. You don't start there, typically, unless all the signs point to that. But let's start, OK? Do they have Epstein-Barr? Do they have you know, uh, mononucleosis? Let's rule some of those things out first. Let the blood work guide where we're going. This is one of those situations where I always tell you, let, let the, the technology, let the, the device you're using, let it confirm your suspicion, your impression. So in, in orthopedics, I tell you your hands should be the final, the, the, the final gauge or the, the decision maker in what you're doing. Okay? In this, you can't see that tissue. You can't see those cells. So yes, you listen. You document all that information. And then you do the blood work. And then you work through the rest of the process in dealing with, OK, they're young. Their overall would be healthy in other areas. So we'll treat them. This is what it looks like on those stained cells. We see these normal cells. Those look pretty happy, like kind of purplish looking ping pong balls with an eyeball. Those look good. But see those two, those two cells that don't seem to fit in? They're the problem. Okay. That's what we're looking for. These cells that, that don't match up, these cells that seem to be maybe a little larger, these cells that don't, don't appear to have the same structure to them. So all those signs and symptoms you've seen except petechiae. What's petechiae? Anyone know? What's petechiae? Ooh, I'm out of stumps here. Petechiae is a, a little red rash, these little dots that appear on the skin. They might have this little, little almost look, looks like a little burst of a rash on their surface. Just depends. I mean, it could be on the face, could be at or around the structure that's been you know, damaged. So that's a good question. I think it just pops up more. And it seems to be one of those rashes where it's not explainable. So a little one comes in and says, hey, mom, dad, I've got this rash. Well, let's check to see what's going on. Sure. How quickly will they pop up? Um, that's a good, again, I don't know that we can time that out. But I, it would be something that a parent would, would say, hey, two weeks ago, you know, Chuck, that's a good, strong little boy name. Chuck had this rash. And he wasn't playing in, the, in a field, wasn't around an animal, doesn't have any allergies, things like that. So now he's got this. Maybe it went away, maybe it didn't. So that's always a possibility. Yeah. Um, you're talking about a lot of um, signs and symptoms. Um, and you were saying earlier it's just like a time frame, which kind of like for the persistence. Is there like a specific like time that you're looking for? Like no, again, we know patients. <clears throat> they typically don't report the first day. You know, they, they're not so sensitive, so concerned with, hey, I'm starting to lose weight, or I've had these night sweats. But if I hear this going on for you know, multiple days, weeks, months, I'm a little concerned. And I think you, as a clinician, you can empathize with a patient who, who comes into your facility and says, hey, I don't feel well and haven't for the last six months. Uh, you just don't want to blow that off and say, oh, you're fine. Okay? You're going to spend some time with them. You're going to ask some questions. You're going to work through the whole assessment and evaluation process. And then hopefully you're going to get to what's really going on. Okay? We, we had a former student. Uh, just a few years ago, who was diagnosed with leukemia. Again, those things happen. Younger population, so keep that in the back of your mind. Not everything's leukemia. We get it. Okay, but it is something to be aware of. Vector borns. We're kind of leaving our cancers and going to talk about these more systemic things. Vector borne. Now, this is something that I would caution you. <clears throat> People think they've been bitten a lot. And yes, it is possible a patient can sustain a bite, whether it's a tick, whether it is a spider. You know how I feel about this. <clears throat> if it's vector-borne, it means 
this illness was transmitted through the bite of an animal, a human being. By the way, typically it's way worse if a human bites you than an animal. And we brush our teeth, usually. I said usually. So when you have a vector-borne illness transmitted, don't blow it off. Even though I'm apt to tell you when someone says I was bitten by a spider, what is it typically? Staph infection. Whether it's MRSA. Not many people, especially in Ohio, are bitten by a brown recluse spider and not know it. Now, if you're sleeping in a sleeping bag and you're sleeping that soundly that a spider gets into your sleeping bag, bites you, and then takes his backpack and leaves, because I'm sure they have backpacks too because they've got to have supplies when they camp. If that happens, then you sleep sound, okay? More commonly, they've incurred and been exposed to staph. In this, we're talking about a specific bite, so a deer tick. Yes, a mosquito, but more commonly, it's the deer tick. And yes, it is called Borrella burgdorferi. burgdorferi. I almost got that right, almost. Here's the problem with Lyme disease. Most people don't realize they have it. Most people, when they get it, notice, hey, there's a tick on my skin. So they use the home remedies, or they, they pull the, the tick off, and part of the tick is still embedded, or they, I've even, again, I'm old. So as a Boy Scout years and years ago, we heard, hey, burn them off. Just light a match and put it on them, and the tick releases. I don't know if it does, but I saw a lot of kids get burned. So that was good. Um, but understand that when you remove the tick, it should all come off. If possible, remove the tick and save the tick. Shove him in a little plastic bag and have him tested. Because, again, he might be the carrier. And if someone has Lyme disease and they don't know it, they may have chronic or at least subacute symptoms that last for up to a year. If it's not treated, it can be fatal, but we don't want that. Here's the rash that appears with Lyme disease. Now again, they may not have this rash for up to 30 days after the bite occurs. So if they come into your clinic two days after and say, I was bitten by a tick, or you know, there was a, an animal that bit me, I would do a little blood work. The more common scenario, though, is six months out, three months out, someone comes in and says, I've got this constant malaise. I'm fatigued. I'm losing weight. I'm missing every class I'm supposed to go to because I need to sleep. I have joint pain. I'm uncomfortable. That ought to raise your red flag and say, is there any chance you've been bitten by a tick? And they'll say, as a matter of fact, I went camping this summer. Or I went to Colorado and did some backpacking. And ever since then, I haven't felt well. Okay? That's a good sign we're going to do a little blood work. <clears throat> if they have Lyme, then yes, we probably need to do a spinal tap. You know that's uncomfortable. <clears throat> and the issue we run into is, again, most people don't realize they have it. They just know they feel terrible. They're wiped out. They may have some, uh, some chest issues, some cardiovascular issues, some arrhythmia. And we treat them with oral antibiotics if we catch it early, or we hospitalize them. And that's probably where we get into the most trouble. These patients that have to be hospitalized, we run IV antibiotics through them, antibiotics through them. but also we have lost some tissue. And you might have a patient who hasn't treated this for six to nine months, and we've got significant muscular degradation. So it, it is pretty significant. Going to the complete end of the spectrum, your text talks about Raynaud's. Now again, Raynaud's is not life-threatening or limb-threatening even. It's irritating, but it is not going to cause the same amount of damage to tissue as Lyme disease would. 
but it is this vasospasm of the tissue, specifically the hands, but also the feet. You can see this. We see it most commonly in the hands. Due to cold exposure, yes, some emotional um, situations and trauma can cause this, but more commonly, cold. And, and you can see on the image, look at the ring finger and the two little fingers. Hmm. That blanching of the tissue, that should tell us they have a cold allergy. We would typically call those wheels, W-H-E-A-L-S, wheels. That's what that is. They'll get some raised patches of the skin. It'll turn white, almost like a cold allergy. And it's, it's characterized by this triphasic color. So we see that they get a pale appearance first. Then it turns this bluish color or purple color because there's cyanosis setting in. And then as they warm back up, the skin turns red. Now again, not going to, to cause loss of, of digits, but it is an annoyance. It is something that causes concern, especially if someone lives or works in a, in a cold environment. And they'll have some disuse. They'll, they'll just feel like moving their hands is hard, moving their feet. First of all, I'd check their their circulatory system, I palpate them, I check pulses distally and make sure we're not missing something else cardiovascularly. But this is an annoyance. How do you treat them? Good luck, I don't know. There's not a really good way to treat them. Tell them to wear lots of gloves. Lupus or SLE, some of you are doing some, some work on that with your uh, Grand Rounds projects, I'm sure. But lupus, <coughs> affects multiple systems of the body. It is an autoimmune disorder, so the body is fighting itself. That's what we're seeing in any autoimmune disorder. It's fighting itself. And so we see structures like musculoskeletal system, the integumentary system. We see other cells in distress. And so we know that when the body is working against itself, their immune system is compromised. They're going to be more fatigued. They're more at risk for injury. And we see that it affects women between the ages of 20 and 45. People ask all the time, does it go away? It doesn't necessarily go away. It's not cured. But it will be dormant. They will manage it well with medication, with steroids, other things. And yes, it is chronic in that it does have the potential to progress. It doesn't ne necessarily have to progress, and even rapidly. It may be slow and over time. But there is no cure. But management is the key. So here are the signs and symptoms before we show some of those. <clears throat> Oftentimes, patients will say, I've got arthritis. They may not have ever really been diagnosed with arthritis. What they're experiencing is some joint pain. Now, they may truly have arthritis, but if they have these other symptoms, start thinking about lupus. The butterfly rash that you'll see on the next slide is classic. It's on the face, right around the, the, the orbit. <clears throat> if they have unexplained seizures and strokes, things like anemia, Complications, I should have indented that, sorry, but complications, things like osteoporosis, some cardiovascular issues, and they're typically, when we're talking about anemia, we're talking about them saying, I'm fatigued, I'm kind of wiped out. Again, this is something, if you see it the first time, you'll probably make a referral. Will you be able to manage this as an athletic trainer? Absolutely. As a PA, yes, but you're going to refer this out to a rheumatologist, a nephrologist. You want multiple groups and practitioners working together because it's going to require medications. 
it's going to require some management techniques that typically fall outside the scope of athletic training. But you've already developed those really good relationships with other clinicians, so that's going to happen. It's funny, treatment is, is sunscreen. That sounds silly. You're like, well, that seems pretty basic. We want to protect the skin. That's part of it. NSAIDs, anti-malarial drugs will help with this to help improve their immune system. And things like corticosteroids, prednisone, medrol dose packs, things like that. Those are going to be what we typically give them. Just remember, as those of you that have already had pharmacology, if you're going to use a corticosteroid more than 30 days, you've got to do some blood work because it causes them to, to feel, um, uh, or causes them to eat more. It causes them not to sleep well. So we don't want to throw off their whole system because then what we might do is run into something like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue. <clears throat> and full disclosure, this is not my forte, these next two. I deal with them, I talk with you about them. Have I seen them? Absolutely. But are they easy for me to assess and evaluate? Nope. I'd much rather see a, sh a shoulder dislocation or somebody who's got some other general medical condition. But fibromyalgia is this chronic non-inflammatory condition. And that's the key right there. It's chronic, but what? It's non-inflammatory. Meaning there's no actual inflammation going on in the tissue. Not just on the surface, but we're talking deep in the tissue. Remember, when you're thinking about an inflammatory condition uh, of internal structures, we can't see that. And it doesn't mean that it's swollen. It just means that it's chronically hacked off at them. Again, another technical term. That tissue is mad, and it's fired up. The problem here is they feel like they have inflammation, but they don't actually have it. So it's hard to wrap our arms around this, especially if you're like me and you're a linear thinker, and you think, well, if A happens, then B, C, and D should happen. In this case, it doesn't happen that way. It doesn't work that way. It is characterized by musculoskeletal pain, but again, it's not inflammatory. So all your tests, all your palpations, they're going to say they hurt, but there's no tissue warmth, there's no edema, there's nothing we would classically see. There's going to be sleep disturbance and fatigue and also depression. All of these clustered together. Again, ladies, this one's for you, it seems. Between the ages of 30 and 50. Maybe it's parenting. Maybe that's what this does. Can I say that? Maybe it's being a mom. Again, younger population. Does it sometimes go away? Yes. Not commonly, but it can. And we don't know why it occurs. And your text is very clear to make that statement. We do know that for some reason they have this alteration of their sleep cycle. And that change in their sleep is chronic and it causes other things to occur. So in Paul, I'm, I'm talking about sleep next week. There's a study out that says if you'll add one, as a college student, if you'll add one extra hour of sleep per night, your academic performance goes up by one letter grade. That's pretty good. If all you had to do was sleep one extra hour and you went from a B to an A, or heaven forbid, a D to a C, that'd be pretty good. Now there's some, some research there. Fibromyalgia patients do not want to hear that, by the way. If you just sleep more, you'll be better. That's not what this is. We do have some, some guidance in terms of diagnoses. This has to be present for at least three months. So earlier, Nathan asked about how many, how many days, weeks, how long can this, does this need to go on before you're suspicious. In this case, you need at least 90 days. And you're going to see some of the, the patterns. And your text has that information as well. But Three months of this chronic pain, stiffness, fatigue. And quite honestly, that's nothing compared to what patients typically endure in this. They're probably going to have these symptoms for well beyond 90 days. That 90 days is the minimum threshold. 
You can see headache, swelling that's reported but not actual, a functional disability. So they might have a limp. They might have some disuse of, of musculoskeletal structures. And I have to keep telling you, it's non-inflammatory. So this is going to confound you and frustrate you to no end. That's why you're using multiple practitioners. You might involve a psychologist. You might involve an occupational therapist, a PT. But it's going to take multi-disciplines to care for this patient. And you see there are seven. There are 19 common sites, but they need to report seven of those in conjunction with the the three months of, of sleep disturbance, pain, that's how we can clinically diagnose them. They need to verbalize on that list of 19, at least seven of those painful sites. That's how we do that. Chronic fatigue, similar. It may frustrate you as a clinician, and it may cause you to, to ask lots of questions. Keep asking questions. Ask them how they're feeling. What brought this on? Why are they so fatigued? Is it because they are a parent? Maybe. Maybe it's a job. Maybe they're a student. But also, we, we see that they're going to have some other contributing factors, musculoskeletal issues, immune issues. This doesn't discriminate based on race, but again, Women in that range, 30 to 50 year old ladies, typically present with this more commonly. <clears throat> I'm, I am convinced it's being a parent. Oftentimes, we hear their symptoms. They say, I'm fatigued. They say, I'm wiped out. I have a low grade fever. I have neck pain. All of these are similar to EBV, or Epstein-Barr virus, which again is the precursor to mononucleosis. Someone can have Epstein-Barr and have it dormant their entire life. And something brings it to the surface. High stress, lack of sleep, poor nutrition. So initially, almost every chronic fatigue diagnosis starts out as Epstein-Barr. And then they progress from there. If you've ever had mono, I won't ask in class. If you've ever had mono, which I did in grad school, you feel terrible. You're wiped out, neck pain, fever. You just feel fatigued all the time. So at some point, your patients probably have dealt with these symptoms. Again, this one's a little different. Instead of three months, we're at six months. And they have to have four of the eight possible symptoms that are listed below. So the sore throat, myalgia, sleep difficulty, cognitive difficulty. I treated a patient for over a year with this, a college student actually. And one of my favorite parts of this was that she got better and she could function. She could actually go to class. And so that was a, that was a big deal for her to be able to function normally in a college university setting. So you have those little victories. Doesn't mean that everything's perfect, but you'll see this and be able to, to be encouraged in that. Oh, pancreatitis. We jump around a little bit, I, I get that. But pancreatitis is that inflammatory condition of the pancreas, and it's caused by these blockages in the biliary tract, commonly from gallstones or from alcohol abuse. When someone has pancreatitis, their belly hurts, and it won't go away. Now, it may be transient, it comes and goes to some degree, but when they have it, they have it. <clears throat> I tried not to put any terribly disgusting or grotesque slides in. But they're going to have this belly pain that starts abdominally and radiates to the back. So palpate them in the belly. Then also listen or ask them, can I palpate your back? You'll know because 
as that third point down, you've already listened to bellies now. They're going to have either guarding, that rigidity of the abdomen, like they don't want you to, they don't want you to touch them. And it's not because they're ticklish, it's because it hurts. But also, they have these hypoactive bowel sounds, a lack of bowel sounds. Remember, if you listen to all four quadrants, you can go from zero to five minutes. That's clinically what you need to do to listen to bowel sounds. So they have a lack of bowel sounds. Now they may have some, but they're not normal. That borborygmy is not present. Some weight loss. They have some elevated enzymes. You can do a CT and ultrasound. And obviously we want to monitor their pain, we limit their food, give them IV fluids. And depending on what's causing it, we might have to remove those gallstones. Or we might talk about, you know, lithotrips and things like that. Yes? Um, is there a specific site that's painful or is it just kind of diffuse? The whole belly is going to be typically sore for them. Yep. And again, that radiating pain to the back. That, the, that's the tricky part of this because sometimes that's kidney as well. And so, and you think you need to palpate them. I know Dr. Morris covered diabetes so well, but I also just want to remind you two types, type one, type two. We really don't use that terminology, juvenile onset and adult onset as much. You know, it's out there. <clears throat> I want you to, re to remember that those type one diabetics that come through your door that are athletic and active, they can still participate. They have to really do a great job of monitoring their blood sugar levels, but they can still compete. So this is not a disqualifying factor. Our type two diabetics, typically older, they can certainly compete. And they don't have to be obese. They don't have to have exceptional adipose amounts, but Again, they can compete, but again, monitoring them. And with diabetic patients, she talked about feet, but also just monitoring their blood sugar. The signs and symptoms, this is what you need to listen for in kids and adults. That excessive thirst, the frequency of urination. They're constantly going to the bathroom. They're always thirsty. They'll be diaphoretic or sweaty when their blood sugar drops. Because they're consuming more commonly these simple carbohydrates, they're always hungry or more frequently hungry. Blurred vision, if their blood sugar drops, they'll tell you, I can, I can sense when my blood sugar is falling through the floor because my vision gets weird. She didn't mention this the other day, but when their blood sugar drops, they'll be disoriented, they'll, they'll have weakness, they may slur their speech, they almost seem intoxicated, and smell their breath. I know in the COVID era, that is not terribly easy to do. But if they have fruity breath, and so everyone asks, what is fruity breath? You ever chew juicy fruit gum? It smells like that. Their breath will smell sweet, and that's ketoacidosis. It's easy to diagnose just based on their breath. And so you'll smell this fruitiness in their breath, and you'll go, oh, that's what that is. They need some form of sugar, and she talked about bolusing insulin and things like that, but they need some sugar, and you'll never go wrong, ever, whether they're hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic. You'll never go wrong with giving them some sugar. Even if their blood sugar is elevated, you already know, then that's not going to bring them back and bring them back around, so you're going to transport them. But more commonly, especially a diabetic patient who knows they're diabetic, their blood sugar has crashed. And so, giving them some orange juice. She talked about uh, what she said, gummy bears the other day. I don't know that I've ever purchased gummy bears for that. that you can do the glucose uh, liquids or the gels. You can do the tablets. I'm a fan of orange juice. It's harder to keep in your kit, but you might have some orange juice around because they don't really have to work hard to swallow that and chew it up. I mean, if they're not, by the way, if they're not alert, you're going to use a gel or something like that, um, but you're just being real careful. And I know we're running low on time. But some of our thyroid issues, anytime, especially with, with females, anytime they're feeling fatigued, <clears throat> they
they're feeling um, yeah, fatigue is most common. Anytime they feel that fatigue, we palpate the thyroid. The thyroid gland itself, the cartilage beside it. They're probably low on THS. And oftentimes we have to just do a biopsy of that. And we may re remove one of those two pear-shaped glands there. You can have hypothyroidism. You can have hyperthyroidism. Hypo is what we commonly see especially in middle age and later staged women. You'll see it diagnosed as Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or Hashimoto's syndrome. And then we also have some hyperthyroidism. We call it Graves' disease. There's an image in your text where the patient's eyes are protruding. They have that exophthalmus. They may have a, a tumor or an enlargement in and around their neck and face. They're over-secreting thyroid hormone. Just like under-secreting is, is important, so is over-secretion of this. And so we have to do some blood work, but it's easily diagnosed because you see this enlargement of the tissues. You see it as a toxic goiter. All right. All right, on Friday... You're going to be back here. You're stuck with me one more time. And then next week we, we go into Monday we have our exam. Wednesday we have another lecture. And then you have your final simulation next Friday in the HSC. Yes, please. Yes, please. Have a great day.